Okay, um, welcome to my presentation about uh, complement clauses in Yihansu. Um, oh yeah. This is the rough uh, outline. So um, I want to talk about um, different types of complement clauses and um, point out some observations that I made. And um, we start with the um, with the um, finite complement clause with kina, which can be translated as uh, that, and it's um, very similar to the that clause in English. Um, we can look at the first example, umitunja um, usigile kina umuhumba wamikumpiti, which means the man thought that the boy has hit the hyena. And um, we find this complement clause with a lot of, of verbs. For example, um, utterance, predicates, um, or um, propositional attitude um, predicates, and a lot more. And um, all the sentences were uttered by our consultant with the um, word order uh, subject verb predict uh, verb object in the main clause and also in the embedded clause and um, I didn't test it a lot but um, it's also um, it can also occur with with other types of um, predicates like um, adverbs um, as we see in in the second example so it's certain that the boy has hit the hyena and um, we have the same clause, but um, a different um, main clause, tai tai. Then, sorry, um, concerning the position of the complementizer, um, I didn't test this, but I found in Andrew's data that um, it seems like the complementizer can um, occur um, introducing the complement clause, as we see in the first example, and it can also occur um, after the subject of the, um, of the embedded clause, as we see in B. So um, in PT, the hyena is the subject of the embedded clause, and then the complementizer follows it. But it seems like um, the complementizer cannot occur at the end of the embedded clause. And then um, I think that um, maybe the embedded clause cannot follow the embedding clause. Um, also, I didn't test it a lot, and maybe the, um, the examples are not very fluctuous because they're a little bit different from the predicates I worked more about. But um, when I tested it, um, the <clears throat> the embedded clause could not stand before the embedding clause, and the speaker showed um, a strong reaction towards this. So he said it's not possible at all. Then um, we also have um, the, sub the subjunctive um, complement clauses in Ihanzu. Um, we can see it um, with in the embedded clause that the verb has this uh, subjunctive um, subject marker. And from my observations um, in my data, it correlates with those verbs that um, that can also function as um, as object control verbs. So, those verbs that can also select an uh, infinitival clause and have an in indirect um, object that would function as the implicit subject in the infinitival clause. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, to demonstrate this, I included also the, the second uh, example in which we have the same verb uh, sinja, which is to force uh, somebody to do something and um, here in, in the second example, we see it 
occurring with the infinitival clause. Then the next observation about uh, finite clauses um, <clears throat> is that uh, sometimes they can occur without an complementizer. Um, and um, yeah, I observed this with those sentences that can occur also with kina. So here we see that um, the structure of A and B, they are the same, um, but in B there is no complementizer. And um, this structure was uh, uttered spontaneously by the speaker uh, with the verbs um, to, to um, ona or ine, which I'm not very sure what is the, the, the stem which is to see or to perceive and with um, loa, but then I tried with some other predicates and and it was also possible. And uh, probably it's possible with a lot of more predicates, but um, yeah. But uh, the first time I saw the structure, it occurred with, um, with C or perceive. And then my first uh, hypothesis was that maybe it has to do something um, with seeing something directly, uh, the action, or seeing another thing and then deducing that this action had happened. So I um, I constructed some some um, contexts and um, also explained to our consultant that um, the man in this case is actually seeing the boy hitting the hyena or he's not seeing it but understanding it through other things like uh, for example in in 8a um, the, the man heard um, the that the hyena was being uh, beaten because the hitting was very loud. And then in B, um, he heard it because the neighbor told him. Um, and then um, this data uh, showed that seeing or hearing something uh, directly or indirectly um, may not have something to do with the use of the complementizer. But um, when the man saw the action happening, the speaker uh, used for the embedded, the progressive form of the embedded work. And when he was not seeing the action directly, um, it was used some, some sort of past, um, for example, in B, the, the perfective form or in the, the, the past form. So, the action was already before the men knowing about it. <clears throat> but then uh, when we look uh, uh, another time at um, the example that we've seen before with um, with the verb ona or ine um, to perceive, we see a very interesting uh, detail that is when um, when we use the complementizer, the verb is not object marked, but then if we um, if we not have the complementizer, then the the verb is object marked for the boy. And um, if we compare this. Um, with another example. So um, the man wants the boy to hit the hyena. We can also remove the, the complementizer and uh, we do not see um, an object marking. And it's probably because when the man sees the boy hitting the hyena, he is, it entails that he's seeing the boy, but if the man wants the boy to hit the hyena, it does not entail that the man wants the boy. So, yeah. Then another type of complement clauses is um, the clause with pizza, um, which is whether or if. 
and um, we have it with predicates that that um, are asking or doubting something and um, the structure is uh, the same as with the kina clauses so we have um, subject verb object and um, Yes, we see it, um, for example, in the first example, um, the man will ask the boy whether he has hit the hyena, or in the second, the man will doubt whether the boy has hit the hyena. And here it's um, interesting because we have the, the predicate shoku uh, hoila, which is um, to not believe. Um, and if we don't have the negation, we would use the, the kina clause, but with the negation, it changes uh, the meaning a little bit. So we have to doubt whether something has happened and we have the pizza clause. Um, then the pizza could not be um, replaced with kina or replaced with um, a null complementizer for some verbs um, but with another verb um, we have all the same uh, all the three structures but we have a different meaning if we use kina or no complementizer so here um, for the example 12 I um, I elicited the structure the man asks the boy to hit the hyena and um, Nico gave me this structures, but he translated is it as the man will ask the boy if he's ready to hit the hyena. And we have if we have the same verb ukum mukoli with pizza, it means the man will ask the boy whether he has hit the hyena. Um, another complementizer is anger, and uh, we can translate it as as if or like. And uh, this structure appeared when I tried to elicitate um, the um, raising structures with the verb to seem. So um, it appears with the predicates igela and tula. And um, for 14a, um, the boy seems to have hit the hyena. Um, I tried to elicitate the boy seems to hit the hyena, um, which is with which can be constructed with an infinitive in English, in German. Um, der Junge scheint die Hyene zu schlagen. But um, in Ihansu, um, the structure was always translated with an finite complement clause and using the um, the complementizer anger. And then if we look at the second example, it seems as if the boy has hit the hyena. Um, if we look at the verb, uh, we see something uh, very interesting, which is this E. Um, and I think it's probably um, um, a dummy agreement um, referring to the complement class. And it's probably um, class eight because um, as we see from, from more data, um, it was also used in a context um, where adjectives um, introduced the, co the complement clause and um, I think class eight is the only one that can have E for verbs and for, for um, adjectives. So yeah, the, probably the E um, has the same function as the it in this case in English. Um, then another uh, type of complement clauses was expressed with the infinitive. infinitive. 
Um, so um, the infinitive mark in this case is Q, which is um, has the same form as um, the non-past or the progressive morpheme, but um, we can differentiate it because in the infinitive um, it has no subject marker. And um, this type of sentences occurred with uh, subject or object control verbs, um, but could also occur with with an adjective, for example, it's bad to hit the hyena. Um, so if we look at A, we have um, the subject control um, example. The boy will try to hit the hyena and in B, um, the man allowed the boy to hit the hyena. We have the, the object control. Another construction um, that that I found with the infinitive was the the verb tula, so to be, with the infinitive, and I think it's a little bit different and maybe a periphrastic construction because um, Nico used it for starting something, so the hyena will start to feel bad. Um, or the boy will start to hit the hyena. And um, then also I found uh, uh, relative clauses. Um, our speaker used this type of clause um, every time when I wanted to elicitate um, a complement clause with the um, um, perception verbs. So um, the relative clause, it's introduced with this N that um, can occupy the first slot of the verb. And um, then um, as we have seen before, the um, INE can also construct with um, with the without complementizer or with kina. So when I asked uh, Nico about um, the man saw the boy hitting the hyena, he used the uh, relative clause. But that, then when repeating, um, and he himself uh, introduced it as the man saw the boy who was hitting the hyena, or the man saw the boy when he was hitting the hyena, and then when repeating uh, the question, um, he said um, the sentence without a complementizer. So the man saw the boy hitting the hyena. And I asked him if, if it was the same, uh, if it had the same meaning. And um, he said that it had the same meaning, but um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if it's uh, semantically um, the same thing, but another um, another interesting mm -hmm. um, variation we see with the uh, verb linga to know, and um, the first example um, I asked Nico um, how one could say the boy will know how to hit the hyena in, in, in Ihansu, and he translated it with the, um, with the relative clause. And then I asked him if um, the same clause was possible, but with the, um, with the infinitive. And then he explained the difference that was in, in the first example, um, with the relative clause, uh, maybe if the boy had doubt on hitting the hyena, he will know how to do it. But in the second example, he said um, that the boy will know the consequences of hitting the hyena. So I translated it as the boy will know what it means to hit a hyena. Um, 
Yes, and then also with with two predicates, um, I found another form in in which uh, the verb occurred only with the ku morpheme and the sem, and was not object marked. So um, I don't know how to interpret this um, this form. But um, I asked Andrew if maybe the speaker um, just forgot to to pronounce the um, the object marker, and uh, he said that this is not very probable. Pro pro that probably he did not um, forget to pronounce it, but maybe it's um, yeah significant and it's another structure. So this is the overview, um, the types of clauses that I have um, talked about. We have the finite uh, complement clauses with different complementizers and without complementizer. And uh, we also saw the non-finite clause. Uh, thank you for your attention and um, yeah, thank you to Andrew for running this course and, of course, uh, to our consultant, Nico, who gave us all the data. Songala Nuewe Aneta, thank you uh, for this talk. I really appreciate how sort of uh, methodically you organized your elicitation uh, such that you could get as many of these sort of very different constructions as possible. Um, and I mean, the data that you engaged with, I mean, you got some really nice stuff and really sort of went deep into uh, the analysis. I'm, I mean, the amount of glossing and, and, and the amount of sort of different structures and 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 your focus on those very uh, small details is really impressive, and of course will be really useful. Uh, I wonder, and I'll I'll ask a first question. I wonder, uh, now that you've got to this point, what you would do in terms of next steps in this analysis. What would you like to do if you had more elicitation sessions with Nico, or if you could take this research project? Uh, a little bit forward? What would be the next things that you would immediately want to know or would immediately want to do? And before you answer, I should say um, that uh, if anybody does want to ask a question, do feel free to raise your hand or uh, simply to unmute yourself and uh, you can chime in. Um. As a next step, maybe I'd like to uh, manipul manipulate um, the data a little more. So um, um, testing uh, maybe different word orders and uh, structures. And um, maybe also because I used uh, the default clause, um, the voice hitting the hyena, mm. and also um, yeah, try it with other um other clauses um and other concepts so that we can have more insight about how the structures function was th there any pattern aneta in in the data that you really didn't expect that was really surprising once you started digging into this or was it mainly sort of just variations on things that you would have expected? Um, I didn't expect the, a relative clause to, to occur. Mm -hmm. And um, first I didn't, um, I didn't uh, recognize it when I saw this, um, uh, the verbs beginning, beginning with, with no. And um I thought that would maybe it was another type of of complementizer that expresses that uh, something is happening at the same time, and yes, but I think um, all the data is very interesting and surprising. 
<laughs> cool. Uh, I see that Prof Hartmund has raised her hand. Do feel free to unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Thank you so much. It's very, very interesting. Um, I I was wondering so about the last point that you had where the infinitival form um, lacks object, like agreement generally. Yes. Um, and I was wondering, so actually I would have expected rather the I don't know. I mean, I'm maybe Bantu behaves like this generally, um, but I was wondering whether whether this is actually the, the surprising case or whether it's actually the other way around that you get subject and object markers with infinitival forms, because usually like infinitival forms, that's usually going usually um, uh, hand in hand, lacking of tense and lacking of subjects so at least i wouldn't expect that much of a subject marker necessarily um depending on how you look at these kind of things so i was just wondering whether whether you know whether you got some information about that um i don't have a lot of information about that but um i think in uh, swahili it uh, behaves uh, like in Nihansu that uh, we have the we have no subject marker, but we have we can have the object marker in the infinitive. I think I'm um, not one hundred percent sure. I can I can chime in and say yeah, you, you you do get the object marking on the infinitive in Swahili for sure. I would be comfortable with those constructions. Okay. Not subject marking, right? Uh, we well, it depends on. Uh, I'd need to think now. Um. Uh, I'm trying to do a translation of what we have here. We will doubt whether to hit the hyena. Yeah, I, I feel, I feel like the object marker is is uh, is certainly okay. Their subject marker, I'd need to, I need to sit down and scratch my head a little bit more on. Maybe that's not okay. Mm. And um, also, um, uh, this form uh, all, um, only occurred with with two predicates, but um, the other form with the infinitival um, morpheme, uh, the object marking uh, morpheme, uh, it occurred with a lot of of in a lot of cases. So, I think it's more common. Right. question sure um, so i was wondering about so your initial data about this uh, where you had uh subjunctive forms mm -hmm. and where you were saying that these were mostly uh or that seemed to be the pattern that these are object control verbs mm -hmm. did you have any subject control verbs uh in your data and what happened with those did you also get subjunctive forms or then the infinitive or what happened with those um uh, subject control verbs so um the subject control verbs um when they were used with um with a, within a final a finite construction they had no no um no subjunctive the only verbs um where the subjunctive occurred um were those verbs that also occurred within uh, object control structures? Did you have to have something like I tried or? Um... Yes, I think. Um... Ah, but I didn't test it maybe with, with Kina. One second for. Uh, for this one, I oh, I only have it with um, with the infinitive. Maybe I ha uh, I I would have to look at um, at my transcriptions for uh, finding a a good um, example. Yeah, so from um, so from a theoretical perspective on these different types of control verbs that would actually be a very nice pattern if you had the infinitival verb 
the infinitival construction uh, with try and then but and then uh, more um, and then with the object control verbs you get something different um, mm -hmm. and in this case some subjunctive form but it's still not like a you know a finite a typical finite clause so that would be like a, a pattern that would match like control theories of different types quite nicely if we don't have any other questions. Uh, all that remains is to thank our speaker, Aneta.